Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. This is your show. And um, we've had a lot of uh, comments about uh, what is minimally invasive surgery and who does these things. Well, I figured I'm going to bring to you what is, in my mind, one of the experts in the field of minimally invasive surgery and also uh, not secondarily, but primarily, a uh, urologist uh, who practices uh, in the uh, greater Fort Lauderdale area. But he's got parents and grandparents all over Broward County and in uh, South Palm Beach County. So uh, he's, he's all over the place. And this is Dr. Eric Chenvin. Welcome, Dr. Chenvin. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you to be here. You're with the uh, practice of, you're with Dr. Fowler, aren't you? Uh, Ronald Fowler and Louis Yogel. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're on, uh, I'm trying to think, Broward Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. Just east of Federal Highway. There you go. We've had so many calls, and uh, really people want to know, what is minimally invasive surgery? Well, again, as, as you stated before, I'm a, I'm a urologist. That's my specialty. But I'm not here just to talk about urology today. I'm here to talk about all the fields of surgery and the aspect of minimally invasive surgery. Right. And to develop a definition of minimally invasive surgery, I think what we're really looking at is the goal of avoiding open incision type of surgery, the old classic type of surgery. And whether that means making smaller incisions and doing a, a sort of mini open procedure, which may have been sort of the minimally invasive surgery of 20 years ago, now moving uh, a lot towards laparoscopic surgery, and even uh, very much so in the case of urology, endoscopic surgery. Okay, now let's help the people here. You're going to say, what is laparoscopic surgery and also what is endoscopic surgery? So help us, help the people out here know what you're saying. Well, I knew that we were going to be talking about some more definitions, so I came with some thoughts in mind. Go ahead. Laparoscopic surgery, which again crosses many fields between general surgery uh, and the subspecialties within general surgery in and of itself, urology, gynecology, um, I'd say those are sort of the major uh, fields. When we talk about laparoscopic surgery, we're really talking about the abdominal cavity or anything just adjacent to the abdominal cavity. Mm -hmm. And it involves making small incisions, usually about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch in size, and using a long camera Mm -hmm. Again, with long, as some people like to say, chopstick-like ki kinds of instruments with the instruments at the end, the same as our larger open instruments with mm -hmm. dissectors and scissors, graspers, different cautery devices, and doing the same surgeries that we've done for years open with these, as, as we'll say, minimally invasive techniques, allowing us to make small incisions, whether it's three, four, five, quarter or half inch incisions, which are going to be a lot less painless, uh, pain, uh, a lot less painful to the patient and still allow us to accomplish the same goal. Uh, let, let me uh, try to give you an example. Uh, uh, a friend of mine just recently had uh, a hernia, traditional, or I don't know, nothing's traditional, but two hernia operations. And it was done, I would assume, laparoscopically. Is that correct, or it would have been endoscopic? I don't think it's fair to assume that. Oh. Certainly, there's no. I, I know that there were punctures. That, okay. That, right. So it and sounds like it was a laparoscopic right. procedure, right. and that's uh, gaining more and more popularity. Uh, there's a lot of general general surgeons are usually the ones that are performing that procedure, mm -hmm. and it usually involves three very small incisions. Uh, as we were talking about before, and you can generally fix both sides um, if necessary, if need be, uh, to do the hernia repair. And it's actually pretty quick. I've been in on a couple of the cases just to watch, and knowing 
knowing from some other, doing a lot of hernia surgery in my uh, two years of general surgery training, which were prerequis prerequisites to my urology training, uh, you can have some pretty challenging hernia cases that'll take you uh, uh, well over an hour mm -hmm. uh, to do. Well, again, and, and I would assume, and let's talk about endoscopic surgery. Go ahead. Endoscopic surgery is now where we're not talking about any cutting at all. So we've actually, we're really talking about true, absolutely minimally invasive, meaning no cutting, we're going through usually the natural tubes or tracts in the body. And this has been going on for years in urology. The actual initiation of it is nothing new. It's been going on for probably around 15, 20 years. What's gotten better is the technology, and it's allowed us to go farther and farther and do more and more. Mm -hmm. The classic type is for kidney stones. Right. Um, what we'll do is we'll take a patient to the operating room and under anesthesia still, we're able to pass a wire up to the kidney under x-ray guidance. And we have very long skinny scopes, some of them semi-rigid, some of them completely flexible that you can pass all the way up through the urethra into the bladder and all the way up into the kidney if need be and take care of kidney stones even all the way up in the kidney itself using a laser, basketing a stone out, completely avoiding the surgeries of years ago, 20 plus years ago, open kidney stone surgery. Well, I can tell you, I mean, I, I, I always say unashamedly to the folks out here as, as a kidney stone victim, uh, the pain is, uh, is, is so uh, dramatic, uh, depending upon the size of the stone. But uh, and the endoscopic approach was used on myself, and it was certainly um, very helpful. It wasn't challenging to me as a patient, and uh, my recovery time was dramatic. So, but I guess any time you re release yourself of pain, you know, it's, it, it, it's always dramatic. Let me, uh, let me get back to uh, the whole question of minimal, minimally invasive surgery because there's so much. I mean, that's, it's sort of the, um, it's become the, the advertised, you know, buzzwords that you see uh, all over the newspapers and medical uh, ads that are in magazines and otherwise relative to, uh, we have these new doctors, we have this new center, we have this, that of minimally invasive surgery. And uh, people talk about certain items, so let's talk about it. They talk about less pain. They talk about uh, quicker times, uh, quicker, uh, I guess you can say, uh, healing, uh, getting back to their jobs, getting back to their normal uh, work week or whatever, or just, you know, a, a life s a style. Uh, they, they talk about the, the non-trauma that's involved. And I see a lot of these ads that, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's uh, again, I, I want you to explain it, how, uh, you know, you, you're not cutting muscle, and you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Uh, but explain to me what creates this minimally, uh, or, or this minimal, uh, effect, the fact that there's less pain, there's a, a quicker recuperative time, uh, it, things are just different. Tell us. Well, I think to explain it, I'll use some examples. Sure. Dating, I'm not as familiar with gynecology, but dating back over 20 years, maybe even 30 plus years mm -hmm. ago, the gynecologists were really the first ones to start doing lapar laparoscopy, and that's really the big push. Again, with the endoscopic procedures, we're really talking about no incision at all. But at least with the laparoscopic, we're comparing small incisions to large incisions. And I think what is a direct correlation is the larger the incision, generally speaking, the larger or the more the pain. And with the laparoscopic surgery, since we're able to make multiple small incisions, and we can make them all over the abdomen instead of just dealing through one large incision and having to push and pull everything to get where we want to go. I think the patient experience 
experiences just simply even less trauma at the site of incision. And certainly that tugging and pulling creates some black and blue type of effects and bruising. Mm -hmm. And that in itself can cause some of the pain that the patients have. I think also the larger incisions, for example, we were talking before the show about uh, removing a kidney Kidneys. laparoscopically, which is becoming commonplace today. Um, the open incision for a kidney removal is usually on the side, and it's usually about eight plus inches long. And that incision usually cuts through muscle, and when you cut through muscle, that often creates um, a lot of pain for the patient. And what happens with a lot of pain, the patients don't move as quickly. They don't get up walking, get back to the regular activities. They use more pain medicine, so then they get constipated and maybe nauseous from the pain medication. And side effects of one or the adverse effects of that larger incision to the surgery then play on to side effects related to the pain medication needed to treat it uh, and other side effects related to that. Yeah, of course, uh, it, and again, it's just that the people ask, and the, the, the questions they say, well, why, why is there so much, you know, they, they, they read so much about minimally invasive surgical techniques, and you, you just hit, I think, on the most, uh, it, to me, it, it seems to be the, the biggest issue, and that's the minimal, minimalization of pain. Uh, and again, I, uh, that's not looking at it from a physician's point of view, but I'm looking at it from these people right out here, their point of view, and that is that you, since you're not cutting muscle and you're not rearranging, you know, moving as many uh, organs or, or, or tissue around, uh, the, the, there is a, a minimalization of pain, correct? I would agree. Right. Also, I, I know that there's a lot of minimally invasive surgical techniques now that are being used urologically. Uh, as well as neurologically. So you have, you have a lot of neurologic spine, uh, knee, joint work that's being done with minimally invasive surgical techniques. Is that correct? Definitely. There's, again, the endoscopic approach. Laparoscopy is an endoscopic approach. Endoscopic means endoscope or a long Right. tubular camera. Well, if we put it into the abdominal cavity, it's known as laparoscopy. If we put it into the knee or the shoulder, into a joint, it's arthroscopy for an orthopedist. If we put it into the kidney or the bladder, it's ureteroscopy or cystoscopy. So a lot of scoping type of procedures. And I personally had knee surgery back about 18 years ago that, as the orthopedist put it to me, when I tore half of my uh, ACL ligament in the knee, common injury with football, which is how I got it, that I was about that far away from an open knee surgery. And having seen someone a year before who had a nice scar about this big on the leg and had a lot of pain afterwards, I was in and out of the surgery, in and out of the hospital after surgery the same day. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, cosmetically certainly better and the same job got done. Well, you're a good looking guy, so nobody's gonna look at your knees. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, the issue uh, really, again, uh, we've had uh, some uh, neurosurgeons that have been here and we've been talking about the utilization of, uh, of minimally invasive surgical techniques some people, again, depending upon, I guess, the time of their education or their long-term experience, still, you know, I guess, want to do it the way they want to do it, which is fine, and they do it excellently. Uh, but then the, the new, a lot of the new techniques, uh, I mean, that because you, I mean, to be very candid with you, the number one uh, conversations that we have with the people out there relative to back pain is always, you know, uh, these, uh, these issues where they have to make a decision as to whether they have surgery or not to have surgery. And that's where we get a lot of comments about, in quotes, minimally invasive surgery. Because I, you know, I don't want to have this big scar. I don't want, I don't want 
you know, I don't want my, this moved or that moved or whatever. And I would assume that there is a lot of that technique that is now transferred to the field of, of neurosurgery. I think in, I can't speak as well, certainly, in the field of neurosurgery, right. because since my residency, I've gotten pretty far right. away from it. But there are definitely minimally invasive techniques to deal with the spine, the discs, injuries to the bone, to the uh, disc, to the nerves. Not everyone is a candidate, but these techniques, these procedures are definitely here. They're here to stay. And I think the good thing is that at least once you're evaluated, you might be a candidate for that type of procedure, that it is out there and is available. Again, just I'm not going to do a laparoscopic kidney removal on someone who unfortunately comes to me with a kidney tumor that's the size of a volleyball right. because it's, it's just not feasible. Right. We're going to need to make an incision the same size as we were talking about before just to get it, the kidney with the mass out. So, yes, I still do some open surgery. But again, let me, let me relate to this because the, the more, as we keep preaching to the folks out there, and I'm going to get to your urology practice in just a sec because I got to get to that, that the, we, we keep, I guess you could say preaching, we keep advising the people out here in a, in a sense uh, that uh, they need to take, uh, uh, pay attention to the indicators. They need to, they need to get to their doctors more often, not relative to just using the doctors for utilization purposes, but you know, you, they need to have the proper screenings. They need to get, prevent the, the, the silent diseases, the, the, the detrimental diseases, even no matter what age they're at. Uh, but at the same time, the, because of more diagnostic procedures, because people are paying more attention to themselves, a lot of the features of the surgical event can be minimalized to use minimally invasive surgery because the individual that, that, that comes in with, unfortunately, this huge tumor mass uh, in, in the kidney, there's had to be some indications if they were under care, you know, what I would call, uh, prevent, you know, I would, I would say maintenance care, uh, preventative care or otherwise, uh, and again, I, I don't mean to get into your field, but it would seem to me that this would have been uh, seen or, or diagnosed a lot earlier so that possibly a minimally invasive technique could have been used rather than the maximal technique. Is that correct? Thanks. I think so. Certainly yeah. when there's a variety of problems that pop up, whether it be pain or bleeding coming from somewhere right. or just something not right. I think if, if a patient is going to see their doctor, certainly after age 50, if not before, every couple of years to get the, a routine exam, a routine checkup, and some routine lab tests, which is recommended by the primary care physicians, then I think we can pick up a lot of these problems a lot earlier and, like you said, apply uh, our minimally invasive techniques and whatever uh, type it is. Certainly colon surgery, um, a lot of my colleagues and friends are doing a lot of laparoscopic colon surgery. Uh, both they and I do laparoscopic adrenal surgery, which is the gland just uh, sits on top of the kidney. Laparoscopic spleen removals, um, it's almost endless. Right. Let me, uh, let me just try to, uh, I, I usually get to what I'm about to ask you at the beginning of the show, but I just, I just thought that this would be a good time to tell the people, how many years of training were involved in your medical training? I mean, the original four years of medical school, let's start with that, and then, then what? The short answer is too many. No, well, <laughs> but it, it gives us, and I can say this because I know of your almost immediate uh, reputation that has come to our community. I know you're new to our community in essence, a few years, correct? Correct. Two years. Right. But uh, you're, I, I mean, I could tell you this because uh, uh, being uh, involved with health professionals all over this county and throughout South Florida, your reputation is building dramatically, uh, uh, both as a human being and as a good doctor, but from a technique point of view. Uh, it, it has come back to me. I'm telling you that in front of these folks. 
uh, but I, it does, just doesn't happen. You do four years of medical school. Tell us then what happens. Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, well. Don't thank me. It's you. Kind words. It's you. Um, you start with four years of medical after your college education. Right. You go on to four years of medical school. Right. So now that's eight years. That's eight years, I guess, of schooling. Right. And then you go on to residency. So at some point, usually at the end of your third year, beginning your fourth year of medical school, you have to decide at that point at least the general field, medicine or surgery, or more specifically in my case, a subspecialty of, of surgery, urology, where you want to go and you match to a residency program at one of the academic hospitals around the country. And then you go on to that residency program. Specifically for urology, probably about 98% of the programs now are six-year programs. Six years on top of the eight that you've already spent. Correct. And usually so. that's two years of preliminary general surgery training, learning how to take care of surgical patients right. in all specialties, in all fields of general of, of surgery itself. And then four years of, sub, of subspecialty specific urologic training where all you're doing is learning the art of urology and urologic surgery. Okay. So then we, from there, yes, that wasn't enough. So I needed to then go on and do a fellowship, right. which in my case was a year. Um, they actually have fellowships a year or two years, and rarely now still there are some three-year oncology fellowships in urology where I spent a year specifically training in laparoscopic urology and complex endoscopic cases and working with some of the uh, world-renowned leaders in the field. So we're talking 16 to 17 years of training, education and training, to have the privilege of having Dr. Eric Chenman now provide services in Broward County. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm saying this because the reason I say this is because I try to make people aware of the fact that uh, they know that we have, uh, Nova Southeastern has this, this huge health complex here, which is has the medical school, the pharmacy school, school of optometry, school of dental medicine, or school of allied health and nursing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they see all these students, and they see them with their, with their scrubs and their, their, uh, their, um, their uh, multiple uh, involvements in the community. Uh, and uh, what happens is, uh, you know, they think, well, that's school is school, and then all of a sudden you have a doctor or all of a sudden you have a, a dentist, uh, all of a sudden you have a nurse. It doesn't happen that way. There's clinical training, there's residencies. Uh, people just don't know. I mean, I, 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 I sort of uh, chortle every once in a while when I read in the newspapers about this tremendous shortage of physicians that we have in the state of Florida. And I, I don't deny the fact that statistically we have a shortage of physicians in the state of Florida. But you, you cannot create new physicians just by creating medical schools. I mean, and again, I'm not getting into the issue, the political issue of medical schools versus no medical schools. I think that, that FIU and, and uh, Centr uh, University of Central Florida, if they, uh, and FAU, they want medical schools. God bless them. Let them do what they have to do. But you don't create m new doctors by just creating new schools. You create new doctors by doing things that Dr. Chenman had to do ex post facto of coming into buildings called universities and schools. And, it's, and you very clearly have stated you've got an additional seven to eight years after you've walked out of these buildings to become the competent professional that you are. That's the point, isn't it? It is the point. Anyway, I made my point. It's just my opinion, folks, but I think that it's pretty valid. Dr. Chenman, very quickly, because we're down to the last few minutes of this show. Uh, firstly, thank you for being here. But I, 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 I think it's important, both from male and female perspective, uh, to make sure that they, they get to see not only their primary care physicians at least once a year. Do you agree? I would definitely agree. And right. I think it's certainly patients get older that uh, maybe a, a healthy 50, 60 year old once a year, even every other year if they're exquisitely healthy might right. be just fine, but certainly as you get uh, 
uh, into the middle 60s and up probably should be going for a yearly physical. And also what happens is because you do the traditional screenings, which are now traditional, the multiple screenings that happen both men and women, whether it be uh, PSA in men or digital rectal exams or you have uh, the issues of, uh, of uh, for prostate uh, disease or uh, whether you have women that, that uh, have pap smears are now more uh, involved diagnostic procedures uh, to prevent cancer or to, or to diagnose the, uh, the, 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 the situation where there's a potential cancer. Those are the things that, that we can uh, help the people so that they have minimally involved activity with wonderful physicians like yourself, although there's a dearth of uh, there's this incredible number of sick people that are out here because well, as people get older, these things happen. Is that correct? I think so, and I think part of those screening tools is to pick disease processes up early so that we can treat them early and have more of an assurance, one, for cure, and two, as we were saying, to, so that you could apply more of these minimally invasive procedures so that if the patient does have cancer or, other, or some other disease process that's going to need surgery, that at least we can get, the sur get them through the surgery, get them through it successfully, certainly that's first and foremost, and get them back to their lives because they need to work most of the time to earn a living. So we need to get them back into their regular daily living as soon as possible. Less pain, less trauma, quicker. I guess you can say, cure to their problems. I think so. Okay. That's uh, Dr. Eric Chenvin, folks. Uh, this is uh, not only the future of, of medicine, but uh, I wanted you to hear, because you asked so many questions about minimally invasive procedures, I figured I'd bring Dr. Chenvin in because, uh, again, even though he's a urologist primarily, and, and he does... Uh, Endourology, which is uh, surgical procedures uh, in the field of uh, uro urogenital uh, diseases. Uh, but uh, the important thing is, is that he's spoken about the subject. So hopefully he's giving you answer to your multiple questions. And we thank you, Dr. Chandran, for being here today. Thank and, you for uh, having me. We appreciate it. Anyway, folks, uh, we thank you for, for turning in again this week. Uh, we hope that we gave you some uh, practical information about uh, questions that you've asked. Uh, this is your program. It's called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University every week. And this is Fred Lipman. Until next time, see you.